recognized thought leader in the data management field. Many of you already know him and have seen him at conferences nationally and worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions. He is the founding director of Data Blueprint, associate professor of information systems at Virginia Commonwealth University, and president of Dana International. Peter has held a variety of positions, two of them at the Department of Defense and Software Engineering Institute. By now, he has written seven books and dozens of articles. He's experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as one of the top 10 data management experts in the world. He is highly desired at conferences and workshops and always travels to numerous speaking engagements and projects. So Peter, where are you today? So we're actually all in the same room, which is, has happened, what, once in the last 12 months, Eileen, I think? I think so, yep. Yeah. Uh, kind of tough. Yeah, so we're, we're just back from the Atlanta uh, Enterprise Data World Conference where we had 700 uh, folks that were all involved in this, having ongoing conversations about these types of issues, and it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal meeting. And uh, Eileen, hopefully we'll get you down there for next year. Um, but uh, thanks to everybody who did come and participate, and in particular, we had a really nice uh, ceremony for John Zachman uh, that worked out really well. And if you didn't get a chance to see that, I think they did tape that, so maybe uh, Shannon will be able to make some of that content available for us later on this year. Uh, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal event. So as always, uh, this is brought to you by Data Blueprint, and we are owned partly by Virginia Commonwealth University School of Business. VCU is the largest university in the state of Virginia, and uh, we are uh, very much uh, a part of the business that goes on down there. So our agenda today is going to start, as always, with our data management overview, and then we'll talk specifically about the DIMBOK definition of what is data security management. We'll look at some very specific concerns that are there. Uh, in that we're going to look at the building blocks of data security management and we'll talk specifically about password and policy examples because you might as well take something practical away from this uh, topic here. And uh, we'll look at data security standards and guiding principles and then finish up as Eileen and Shannon have both indicated with some Q&A at the end of this. That's really a very interesting part of the program for us because we learn what your concerns are and how to tailor this event to make it more useful for you all the way around. So let's get started with our data management overview. Uh, all of these talks start out in exactly the same way, which is that we have a wheel here on the right-hand side of your screen that shows what we consider to be the data management body of knowledge. Uh, and at one part, in this case, right at about 4 o'clock, we're looking at data security management. So we started out in January with data governance, moved up to data architecture, development database, operations management was our topic last time. And our next time, you can see, is going to be on reference and master data management. Uh, the DIMBOK is designed specifically to help individuals, data management professionals, you, our audience, prepare for the CDMP. Now, just before we dive into the CDMP, uh, again, you can get your copy of this at um, Amazon if you need to get a copy of it. It also covers things like organizational culture technologies, in other words, the non-technical aspects uh, of this as well. And as we mentioned every time, the CDMP is the Certificate Data Management Professional. And I do want to make a shout out. My entire staff this last week uh, passed the CDMP, so we uh, consider ourselves to be the only fully qualified firm out there. Um, I'm sure there won't be, though, because we had about 50 that passed it at the Enterprise Data World this week, and we're close to about 700 people worldwide uh, that have followed that particular process of passing three exams. Again, it's a core exam and then some specialty areas that you can go into. There's more information on the link that I think has provided you on this particular slide. Now, when we talk about data management, we usually are talking about something that most people don't understand very well or they don't intuit very well. And actually, Megan gave us a good example right before we went on. It's kind of like flour. Nobody really wants flour, but you can't bake without flour. So we kind of do the same thing for data management. We like that analogy uh, that works out there. We put this slide up. It's an after-lunch slide designed to confuse and hypnotize you. Um, so we'll give you the management version of it very, very quickly. What it really means is in data management, we have five different specific activities. The first one is making sure that we're all singing off the same piece of paper, managing your data coherently. And if you didn't catch on the slide before there, the only input to that box is your organizational strategies. So if you don't get your, this, your data management direction from the organization strategy, you're missing something in your organization. You'll have a lot of trouble 
uh, doing anything coherent as well. Second data management function then is to share data across organizational boundaries, whether that is program to program, whether that is part of your organization to another part of your organization, or whether that is between your organization and your partner organization, it is still important to do that efficiently and effectively, and as we're talking about today, securely. The third data management function is data stewardship. This is the business of assigning responsibilities for data. If it's not personally responsible, somebody else uh, will think it's somebody else is doing it. And if everybody thinks everybody else is doing it, then it doesn't get done and we have real problems there. Fifth one is data development. This is the idea of building data delivery systems. Again, in our colleges and universities, we teach them that the only operational way to do this is by building a new database. Uh, of course, if you teach everybody how to use a hammer and only a hammer, then every problem tends to come out looking like a nail. And so that's an area that we're working on very, very hard. Uh, in that. And finally, our fifth area is data management uh, support operations, which gives us the ability to maintain data business continuity et cetera, et cetera, within there. So this is the context in which the rest of this operates. Now we'll dive into what do we mean by data security management. And let's go straight to the DIMBOK here. This is our summary slide. We'll come back to it at the very end as well. The definition here is, again, planning, development, and execution of security policies and procedures to, to provide proper authentication, authorization, and access, and auditing of data and information. Now, what does that really mean? Well, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. Again, for those of you who haven't seen this particular IPO diagram, on the left-hand side, we have the inputs, the activities in the green box, and the deliverables, the outputs on the far end of the, the right-hand side of the diagram. We also are going to talk a little bit about the participants, uh, the tools, and the consumers that work within here as well. So this is our context diagram for the discussion that we're having here. Uh, and again, I already read you the definition once, so you can see how that flows into all aspects of the uh, data management process. So why is data security important? Well, it turns out it's important for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons is that we have to make it relevant for your organization. So we're going to give you a bunch of examples here, and our goal, hopefully, is that some of those examples will actually be useful for you guys. If they're not, look for these examples. Do a little bit of reading up. Um, Again, we've been tweeting and blogging about this on our website as well. If you can't find a story that's in your industry, let us know, because uh, we probably know a lot. The point is, we want you guys not to have the mistakes and oops that some of these other organizations have had in this particular process. Now, what we're looking at here is very much what are the concerns. And the first concern in most everybody's mind is confidentiality. It's, again, if we have organizational uh, documents that we want to see, but we don't want to tell the competition what's going on. This is confidentiality. And if you look at the cyber attacks that have been happening worldwide now, they are targeted attacks. This is as simple as and as specific as company X is trying to break into company Y's computing systems so that they can steal some company secrets from them. And if they steal company secrets from them, that's going to be a problem no matter what. You work really hard to keep your IP, your intellectual property, uh, uh, safe and, and confidential. And consequently, you don't want anybody else just to be able to do it just because somebody in your web operation leaves a portal open or something like that. The second issue from the security concern perspective is to make sure that people actually have the right numbers. And this reminds me of a task we did for the Bank for International Settlements a couple years back, where they were very concerned with making sure that when they put out numbers, everybody knew they were official numbers. Uh, those of you that are international, the U.S. is, of course, going through our perpetual presidential election cycle. And if somebody were to release false numbers about the employment uh, right before the election, that could have an impact on the election. Uh, so again, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics puts numbers out, they want to make sure there are no changes to that data except for the intentional changes of that data. By the way, they also, you'll notice, release their statistics in two forms. They release their preliminary statistics, and then they tell where it's likely to be, and then they actually do a follow-up and say, what are our actual statistics? And we'll hear the employment rate was revised upwards or downwards. That is an intentional uh, data integrity issue that they build into their process. The third security concern is availability, making sure that we can get access to the data when it is needed. It doesn't do any good to be able to say, oh yeah, I can get that for you, but it's going to require two days and three people's worth of type and information in order to find it. If people need the information, they need it now. And if they need it now, they've got to be able to get it to you. Finally, 
our first top concern for data security is what we call non repudiation This is the idea that I sent it to you, and you'd be amazed when I do a lot of work in uh, the um, legal area, people just take an email, print it out on a piece of paper, and assume it's an actual email. But if you can't prove that that server that went to a server and came out on the other end and was delivered to somebody's mail, then what's to stop somebody from making up false information, listing it as an email? Most judges aren't aware of this, and so they just don't really know exactly what it is they're trying to do uh, when they look at these things. Now, talk about data security requirements. We basically group them into what we call the four A's, and they are authentication, authorization, access, and audit. Each in order, authentication is that they are valid users who are what they say they are. Uh, when I log in and with my passport and come in from uh, outside, I use my fingerprints uh, in order to do that, and they match that up and do all sorts of other types of, of checking just to make sure that I am who I am. Authorization then, make sure that in this case Eileen has access to certain types of information around the organization here that may not be appropriate for everybody else to have, certainly not for our, our clients in many cases uh, in order to do this. Access, make sure that they're going to be able to put this information, being able to access the information in a timely fashion. So again, it doesn't do any good if we're going to deliver it late and after the uh, time it was needed. And finally, auditing, which is just on a periodic basis, we, like all secure organizations, go through security audits uh, to make sure that we are, in fact, doing what we preach that we're doing. Now, what we've done here for you all is worst data breaches of 2011. And many of you will remember some of these. Again, the idea is hopefully that you'll see something in here that might be relevant to your organization. Because if you have trouble selling this concept to your management, you just have to say something like, you don't want us to be like Sony. Now, what happened at Sony? Well, there were literally 100 or so, uh, I think it's 100 million user records on that one uh, that were out there um, that people got a hold of, which were credit cards and other sorts of information uh, types of things that were out there. You may not know what spear phishing is and things like this, but again, it goes out and accesses 60 million customer email accounts. That's a conservative estimate. Well, believe it or not, you're uh, email accounts probably been grabbed already. It was the largest one ever, and of course, Epsilon being a company that claims to manage data very, very well, it doesn't look really good for them. Another one is the RSA. Again, they had an issue there with their little fobs, and you may have seen the little fobs that some of us carry around to log on to various systems. They replaced a lot of those fobs last year. In other words, I'm here, I write, type in my password, my keyword, but I also have to look at this thing that tells me uh, a particular number to put in at a particular point in time. And again, big companies have gone and replaced their entire set of fobs as a result of this data breach uh, that was there. Fourth one is Sutter Physician Services. Again, 2.2 million patient medical details. This is not the type of thing that we'd like to have happen if I was one of their, their patients, uh, you know, if confidential information has gotten out. The data was unencrypted and worst, it was unsecured. So anybody could get a hold of it. Again, very, very problematic. If you've been to your physician in the last couple of years, you probably have seen some of the increased measures that they're putting in place uh, in order to do this. Uh, again, fifth one here, TRICARE and SAIC. This was simply something somebody had put some backup tapes in somebody's car and they were stolen from it. Ended up costing these organizations $5 billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, finally, our sixth one, again, was the, the NASDAQ. And again, this was uh, uh, accessing information that the top executives in the company leader had that was definitely not information that they wanted to make. Uh, public on all this. There are many, many other examples here. Uh, TJX in particular uh, had a lot of credit card companies, uh, uh, credit cards that were taken out. Uh, in fact, I lost one of my credit cards in that particular one because it was on the system uh, that was able to do that. And the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, we've heard that one uh, probably as well. These are all problems, which leads us to our first question for you all. Uh, what is the cost of data security? In other words, when this happens, What's the estimated cost per individual breach? I think Eileen is pulling the polling information up there. We can take a quick minute here and let you guys do a little bit of voting. Did we tell them we were going to do polling on this one before Eileen? We might have forgotten to mention that, didn't we? Yeah. We'll write that into the beginning script here. Okay. So some of you are cynical. We're watching the numbers come up here real quick. We'll give us another few minutes here to... 
that we come up with. Looks like it's pretty well. What's the biggest area that they're voting for? But A, I can't see from here. It looks like it's the majority thinks it's B, so 1,026. And then the second most highest estimation is B, so 476 for C, 855. Do you want to reveal the answer? Please? Yeah, I think we do. That's kind of an interesting one. So we actually, uh, the actual number there is only $194. Uh, it's still a lot of money when you multiply it by 20 million customers or 2 million customers. It's an awful lot, but you guys think it's worse than it is. Um, and that is probably one of the main lessons of this particular one. As we did our research to come up and do this, we find that the cost of individual data breaches are decreasing for the first time in seven years. That's a very important statistic. It means two things. First of all, it means that by putting in place these CSOs, Chief Security Officers, or CISOs, Chief Information Security Officers, they are starting to do their jobs, which means the low-hanging fruit that the criminals are looking for uh, is actually becoming harder for them to reach, and the actual cost of processing this is uh, is, is becoming less. In other words, what we're doing here in DEMA is working. We are now starting to see we are applying better security to better managed data, and we're now starting to achieve lower costs for the organizations. It turns out the cost of individual data breaches is dropping here as well. Uh, actually, that one's yeah, dropping from uh, 7.2 million in 2010 to about 5.5 million in 2011. Um, we do have some malicious attacks that are going up because companies are, are having to recover from that. The other part of this, though, that makes it very, very interesting is that these costs are lower if organizations have a CISO. So if you have an organization that doesn't have a CISO, say that one of the ways you can lower your costs is by hiring somebody whose job it is to maintain information security. The average data breaches have declined by 16 to 18%, and the uh, weird customer turn issues that come as a result of that have also declined as well. Um, we're seeing in 2011 an increase in the number of negligent insiders. You think since we've been at this for a good long time, we'd actually be doing a little better than that, but still, it's good to know. And, and here again, 24% of those are caused by systems glitches. Well, no. These are things we've got to watch out for as we, uh, we take care of uh, all of those things. Again, what's happening here? Well, we have a lot of malware, malicious insiders, and one third of all of these attacks are coming from people who are disgruntled on the inside. Uh, in this, the detection costs are also becoming cheaper uh, in this case, so down by about six percent. And the notification costs, though, are increasing because we have to actually have positive confirmation that people have gotten their uh, information in order to do this. So when we look at all of these other types of costs, again, we lose our customers. Some customers decide they don't want to do business with us anymore, so we have to replace them. That costs a lot of money. Uh, there is a value that we can put on these stolen data uh, pieces, and the accounting boards are now starting to take this into consideration how much the organization's data is worth. We have costs that are associated with protecting the victims of this. Uh, again, whether it's getting them those social security numbers and other IDs and things like that. Uh, there are remedial security measures that we put in place to uh, try and keep this from happening. We can. And, oh, by the way, there's fines and lawsuits that come into this. We already talked about a $5 billion fine and lawsuit that was uh, experienced by one of these. But what it really does boil down to is at the very end, you've got the loss of goodwill and reputation. Somebody who used to trust your organization no longer trusts your organization. Now, here's a couple more examples of security breaches as we're getting ready for our second polling question up here. Again, just a hospital in Boulder, Colorado, throwing medical records in the trash can. Uh, again, radiology data that's being stolen because it's exposed to the internet. Three million names of addresses, data births, and social security numbers were stuck on a portable media device. That would be a USB drive or something like that. Uh, again, just that you've done this uh, for the, the you know end of time on this. Uh, one of my favorite ones on this is Thriving Financial. Again, great organization, one laptop, 10,000 customers that are out there. And even if it is only 20 or 30 bucks per customer, it's still an awful lot of information, an awful lot of time. So our question for you, second question that we have for the polling question, is how much time should be committed to data security? I want you guys to spend a minute on there and see what you think.
also kind of having fun with all this instant poll stuff, watching all of these things here. And it's really interesting to see how it comes up. And like I said, I haven't actually been in the same office and done one of these with Eileen in over a year. So <laughs> super set up in here. So what do we got, Eileen? Looks like most people. Oh, we just. Oh no, no mind. Come on, change their minds. Take a little bit of time, but not too much to vote. Looks like it's pretty much uh, uniform. Everyone uh, went for B. That uh, data security should be an ongoing activity. And that is, of course, certainly what we agree with as well. It should be an ongoing activity. If you can imagine spending all of Monday only and doing your work then, uh, it really would not result in a satisfactory outcome for organizations on this. And, and this is a great cartoon. Um, I, I generally don't show these things, but John Schlosser did this one a couple of years back. You know, we've got everything going on the left-hand side of the screen. In this corner, we have firewalls, encryption, antivirus software, and in this corner, we have Dave. And Dave, of course, represents human error. If we have humans in the picture, they are likely going to do something just like users that we had not expected. And when that happens, we have unintended consequences. When that occurs, we have generally some problems. So let's take a look at some data management security building blocks and see how we would work our way through there. And again, remember we started this particular session out back in January with data governance. So we're working our way through data security. All the way on. And we're going to look at the goals and principles, the activities, the primary deliverables that we're talking about, roles and responsibilities, technologies that you need to have, practices and techniques, and the organization and culture. Let's jump right in. First goal and principle is to enable appropriate and prevent inappropriate access to and change to data assets. Now, uh, I'll tell you a quick story on this one. Uh, I replaced a fellow at a university, uh, won't mention any names, who had been uh, clocked but as changing his um, grade from his computer terminal at a time when he was sitting at his desk. And he changed his grade from an F to an A. Unfortunately, at the time, we didn't have any laws in place that uh, actually caused this individual to be charged with a crime. So we had to wait until the legal profession caught up with us uh, in order to do this. It didn't help also that he changed his wife's grade in this case uh, as well. So it was kind of obvious that it was him and his wife that were doing this particular uh, particular piece. And again, it was the law was not inappropriate access. Well, obviously, the law has changed since then, and we now have laws that prevent this type of thing from occurring here. But here was a case where we were out in front of the law. We couldn't do this. Uh, we couldn't prosecute the individual for it uh, in order to do it. It was just a very, very sad kind of a thing. And the only reason we caught it at all was because we had an audit program that went through and took all the grades that were Fs or incompletes at that point and showed and compared them just to make sure that nobody was in fact going in and changing the grades. And by golly, we caught somebody. Second goal in principle then is that we have regulatory requirements for privacy and confidentiality. And those change from organization to organization, from industry to industry. Those of you that are in healthcare, of course, know it's a lot more strict uh, in that case. But if those of us in higher education, uh, there are very specific personal information uh, privacy laws and things that we get that we are, are, are charged with that are different from somebody who might be in, for example, the construction industry. And our third category then is to ensure that the privacy and confidentiality uh, needs of all the stakeholders are met uh, on that one. Not sure where I put the word endure in there, Eileen. I'm no, I did that particular one. So uh, I have to come back and catch that one for next time. So another thing that comes up with this regulation, this is one of the things that makes this such a challenging area for data managers, is because we have competing concerns. Me as a client to the hospital is going to have a very different uh, type of information than me as a consultant to the hospital. Uh, again, a student record is going to be different from a faculty record. So these are things that we want to make sure that we know how to balance and know where and which comes first. I have some very good colleagues in the United Kingdom uh, in DEMA that we're doing uh, some very interesting work. And one of the things they say to me is, you know, if I go to jail, Peter, you're coming to bail me out. And I say, yes, you're right. If we do something that bad, I will personally come and bail you out because they are not complying with the government regulations and the restrictions that are there. So we have certain things that we want to restrict access, obviously anything having to do with national security, 
On the other hand, we have just the opposite. We want open government. We want transparency and we want accountability. How do you draw the line between the two of those? It's a very, very difficult balancing act to do this. We've also got proprietary business concerns. Again, things that are going to give us a competitive advantage, that are going to protect our intellectual property, and that are going to allow us to know more about customer needs and relationships uh, that are there. And, and I'm going to deviate on this one for just a quick second here. Uh, one of the things you all might have noticed is that Apple's Siri program is kind of an interesting thing. We have a little game that we play to try and get Siri to do really interesting things. We've given Siri some very interesting challenges over the year, but you know who's listening into all those conversations? Apple. And they are developing intimate knowledge about my knowledge, uh, the types of things I want to do Siri with, which, by the way, you might want to think twice if you ask Siri where to bury the body. We tried that one yet, Eileen, that's a great one. <laughs> ask, ask Siri where to bury the body sometime, and she'll give you a lecture on that, <laughs> uh, which gets us back to legitimate access needs. Yes, that's a joke, and Siri understands that it's a joke. But on the other hand, it is a kind of an interesting process uh, in order to do that. So balancing those activities is a very difficult piece, and clearly, again, you want professional uh, systems in order to do that. It means you're going to be knowing and understanding the data security needs and the regulatory requirements that are occurring within there. And there are going to be different series of them. There's going to be business requirements that may potentially compete with those regulatory requirements as well. Uh, we also want the data security group to define the data security policy. And when you go out and survey organizations, you'll find that time after time they don't have a data security policy. So then they go with a blanket one and it says, well, all data is confidential. Oh, well, if that's the case, then I can't work from home. You know, the, I mean, it's, it's just as simple as that, uh, or it could be as simple as that. Um, we also want them to define not just the policy, but what are the standards that we're going to be using. Right now, everybody says, uh, we're using industry standard encryption to encode your credit card information uh, as it goes from place A to place B. Uh, I had another security uh, uh, violation over the weekend where my US Air uh, MasterCard people started calling me and saying, hey, did you authorize something to be taken from you in the Middle East? <laughs> No, that's not me. And I said, yes, well, we may have good security standards, but it doesn't mean it's going to cover everything. It just covers most of the things in there. What you really need to look for is what are the information classifications that you're going to be using in your organization. There may be some things that you want to have confidential. There may be some things by default for that. There may be things that you want to do by default to be open. Again, these are going to be things that you can solve for your organization. Then you want to audit it. You want to periodically come into the organization and find out who's doing what with what and whether they are meeting or not meeting their various uh, requirements that we have. If they're not meeting them, then that tells us that we need to increase the, um, the uh, uh, restriction that we have in there in order to do it. We can no longer depend on people trying to do it themselves. We may have to go to a default of protection rather than a default of open uh, in those areas. Uh, we want to define the security controls and procedures. We want to manage the users, their passwords, the group membership uh, in order to do this. And by saying passwords, we're not making pick a password, but we are making sure that you use good, solid passwords. Uh, one of the things that we're sort of frustrated about with our own university is that they will only let us use upper and lowercase characters and numbers. You know, we can't use special characters, which means it's just a matter of time before that particular piece gets uh, uh, passed because you can do that through a brute force attack uh, in order to do that. We want to also then manage classes of data access views and classes of permissions. And this is the key here. As you know, with most data management activities, we're trying to manage not just an individual customer's record, but a class of customer records or a class of product information uh, types of things. These classes of end up being the same thing that we need to apply in the data management area from security perspective. We call them roles. What are roles of the users that are going to be uh, in there? And finally, we do want to have monitoring of user authentication and, and access behavior so that not anybody can log on to our system. Uh, again, we're here at Data Blueprint World Headquarters. We joke about that a lot. Uh, but we have uh, uh, our network secured so that people can't gain access to them by just being close to the building uh, and things like that. And we have active monitoring in order to be able to take care of some of those things. So let's walk through now what are the primary deliverables here. The first one is data security policy. And again, the goal here is to provide relatively thin documentation. A policy should not be a 100-page manual because people can't read it and absorb it. In fact, the policy ideally should be a couple of sentences. Now, 
you might want to look at your own organizations and see what you have there. First of all, if you don't have a data security policy in place, give us a shot. We'll be glad to help you get one together. Um, but if your data security policy is a book that's three inches thick, that's not going to be helpful either because nobody can read it and understand it. The goal of a policy is to say, uh, well, let's just take Google, be not evil, right? That's exact Google thing. But, you know, it's something that they claim guides them as a, as a business. So these policies are things that would allow the basic user in the organization to sit down as a knowledge worker and say, okay, what does the policy say? This should guide my behavior, something that we're looking for to help guide your behavior. The second product that we're going to pull out, the deliverable here, is what we call data access views. These are views that are technical database views, either logically or physically. Uh, most of the time they are instantiated physically, but they are defined logically, that say to people, hey, this is a view of information that contains no personal data, personally identifiable data. Uh, for example, that they may want to put to a professor so the professors can assign grades for that particular piece. It's not critical that we understand all of that. It's only critical that we're able to identify every student separately from every other student in that particular process. So these data access views, once they are permitted to be out there, we can then say class X of users can get to class Y of data views in order to do this. We may want to also then document, uh, classify documents uh, according to these various classifications here. And again, the goal is not to have every individual document say only Fred can see this one, but Eileen can see that one, and, and Lewis can see this one, but Megan can't see that one. That gets to be very difficult. But if we say instead, these types of users with these types of roles can gain access to these types of documents, that is the type of thing that's going to allow us to do this in a very, very uh, simplified fashion. It's not simple, it's, excuse me, I should be careful on this. I always like to say it's not easy, it's easier, much easier than it would be if you're trying to do it in another fashion. Then we also want to look at data security audits. How many do we need? Well, maybe if we do it once a month the first year and we find things are going pretty well, we can move it to quarterly. But if you don't have that objective information, you can't do it. How deep should our security audits be? Again, I mentioned before, Data Blueprint does classified work for the government, so we have a very separate set of security classifications that come in with us. And the people from the um, government come down on a fairly regular basis and, and help us uh, perform security audits and make sure that we have uh, things that we're complying with on here. The next one is data security controls, and these are things that are enabled to just make sure things don't get tripped. Uh, again, if you're walking out of the building with a laptop that doesn't belong to you, uh, that may be a problem for people. Many of you have seen this when you work in different organizations. They register your laptop as a guest laptop so you don't get asked that question as you go in and out of the buildings. What are the organization's data privacy and confidential confidentiality standards? Again, do we have them? If we don't have them in place, it's a little bit difficult for people to say you're doing something correct or incorrect. In fact, if it never does go to the legal standard of things. The first thing the judge will ask the organizations, do you have a document retention privacy confidentiality policy? If you do, then the next question is do you follow it? Because if you have one and you don't follow it, it's not much good. If you don't have one at all, then we don't have any expectations uh, in terms of how people work with that. Got to move some questions on that. Happy to answer them as we get to the Q&A point of this. Uh, another one, again, user profiles here. What we're trying to do is just simply say, how are people set up for the computers? If you look at your computer, when you define a login, you will often say this user can administer the computer or this user can only access the computer. If you can't administer the computer, it means it's easier to take care of because you're not likely to put special programs and do installations and modify things that are on there. But if you're a system user, uh, excuse me, a system uh, administrator, then you have a lot more things you can do with your computer. So again, what are we going to do from a profiling perspective? What are we going to do for adding passwords and how secure we're going to maintain them? And what are we going to do for membership in different types of role model groups that we have uh, in order to do this? What do we have in terms of data security permissions? Again, here what we're looking for is do we have things protected by default or do we have things open by default? Each of these are good. They're very perfect for different organizations or different parts of organizations. So you can bring this down to a departmental level. 
again, the question is, what are you doing with it, and what are you going to be putting in place, and then how well is it working? Because it's not good to just put it out there. You have to put it out there and see how it works for the organization. I, I will put in a brief reminder with all of these things, too. Uh, again, the last one is authentication and access history. So when are people getting in? How often do you force them to sign on and, and re-sign in? Uh, I think Google lets you stay on. No, Facebook lets you stay on for like two weeks or something like that if it is. No, it may not be Facebook there. Everyone's shaking their heads saying that's not the right one. Maybe it's Google that lets you get in on uh, the, the – I've got some of these things where logs on says keep me logged on for two weeks. Right? Well, that may be good. It may not. Sometimes it's keep me logged on for 20 minutes. Also, it depends, of course, whether you're accessing it from a private terminal on your own that's behind the lock and key or whether you're in a public access space. And, I don't know about you all, but if you go to the airports a lot and you get up from a public computer terminal, somebody will sit down almost immediately right behind you, and they're checking to make sure you actually logged off, because if you didn't, they could have access to your whole bank account. Now, the reason this is not as easy as we'd like it to be is because we really don't have much history in this area. What we're doing is looking at a total of about 50 years' worth of history in terms of uh, access and security of computing records and, and all sorts of other things that don't get us uh, where we'd like to go either. So all of these are, are things that are going to take time to build up. You're going to have to try them for your organization. The first guidance, of course, is what you have to do to avoid getting thrown in jail. But the second part of it is what's going to work well for your organization. And you'll probably have to try some things. So it's also a good idea as you're implementing these things to not simply say this is the way it's going to be, but to say for the next year we're going to try this, which implies at the end of that year you're going to revise your procedures, look at the data that you have, and see whether you need to become looser or tighter with respect to your security requirements. Obviously, if you put in a place and you have five security breaches, don't wait till the end of the year uh, to go revise that. But if you get to the end of the year, you might want to say, hey, how's it been going? Um, are we, for example, in line with everybody else where about one-third of our data security breaches are, in fact, coming from inside? If one-third of them are coming from inside, then we may need to increase our efforts at internal protection uh, in order to do that. Now, whose roles and responsibilities are responsible for all of these things? So we've got three groups that we put up here. First of all, the suppliers of the data, the people who are providing the data. And if you look here, we've got the data stewards. Now, we talk about them in a later uh, session in this particular series here, but a data for some aspects of the data. And when they do that, those data stewards are the people who are best knowing the data, best knowing how to do it. We can't have everybody know all of the data. It doesn't work that way. These stewards work in conjunction with an IT steward steering committee that hopefully has chartered a data stewardship council or a data governance council. Those groups are the ones that should be setting policy. And again, we're not starting off with this let's boil the ocean approach. Let's take 10 top data items and pay attention to them. Uh, one of the large groups that we're working with right now is, is working with a really interesting topic called hospital admission date. Now, hospital admission date means, in this case, 12 different things that we found in the organization. But the question is, what does the government think it means? And it turns out that we get a lot of our money from the government for this particular hospital, so it's an important aspect of what we're talking about. Again, consistent definitions here. Is the admission date the day treatment starts? Is it the day they walk in the door? What happens if you walk in the door at 11.59 and you don't get treated until 12.01? Right, well, there's got to be a rule in place that tells what that is. And if we don't know what that is, it means people will be making different choices based on different sets of circumstances, which means our results will be inconsistent. And more importantly, it will be very difficult to run the organization as a result uh, of that. Again, our suppliers also include the government, where we get an awful lot of data, and finally, customers, where we get it. There's a great rule that uh, our good friend Joseph Polo likes to say over and over again, if it doesn't cost you anything, then you are the product. Think about that, Facebook users. If it doesn't cost you anything, then you are the product. So all those billions and billions that are getting ready to be iPod in Facebook, you are the product. Hmm. We've got consumers, and this is, we're getting better awareness on the consumer side. People are now starting to say, my mom will call me up now and say, hey, I got this thing from my bank and it wants me to put in my social security number, send it back to them in an email. I don't think I should do that, right? Yeah, mom, that's it, exactly right, don't do it. Consumers are getting more knowledgeable, but there's still an awful lot of bad guys out there that are trying to do this. And it's not always just bad guys. It may be somebody responding to a legitimate inquiry from the news or something like that. Well, again, if you don't have a policy in place, 
how are people going to know what they can and can't do? After all, it's just a newspaper reporter. Why shouldn't I give them information? That's their job, isn't it? Again, it depends on your perspective, your industry, exactly what's going on there. We also have, again, managers, executives, consumers, and data professionals that know this. Data professionals are probably the most knowledgeable about this. Um, you also have some very specific designations at the end, and maybe one of our, our um, uh, delegates can actually chime in at the end here and talk to us specifically about what you can do to become certified. Again, if you get the CDMP, that means you can pass a group in this area, but you also could pass it in data warehousing or other things. So the CDMP does not give you the security credentials that you need to have, but we do consider it one of the core areas of data management uh, that's within there. Finally, we have the participants uh, that are in the process. And again, the stewards show up in here a couple different places because as a data steward, you're also responsible for evaluating the data that comes into you. Remember, you're looking at it as an asset, the data as an asset, and you're trying to determine how useful it is for making good decisions. Eventually, your organization will have something akin to the data security administrators. They work very closely with your database administrators, and your database administrators determine who gets to log on, who gets to log off the various system. You may have business uh, analysts, uh, it's going to be business intelligence analysts who are looking at this, and they're going, oh, this is fantastic. I've got a great new product from company X that lets me take this BI stuff and push it down in front of my tablet, and it's just fantastic. And then you find the tablet is insecured so that anybody can pick up this information uh, just by leaving it lying around. Ask the TSA people next time you walk through the airport how many smartphones and tablets get left at the TSA places, and you will be absolutely amazed at the, uh, the, the number of these things that don't get put in place. Well, and of course, we want you to work with the data architects in the group. The data architects are the folks who can help you design a system that is flexible and adaptable that will handle today's needs and also be able to adapt easily to tomorrow's needs without having to re-architect your entire data platform if you do this. Your CIO, CTO is going to be helpful in that area because they're the ones that are translating company strategy in order to get something to you. And of course, your help desk analysts are your first line of defense uh, when people call in specific questions and things like that. Uh, so this gets us to our, our fourth polling question that we have in here. Who do you all think is responsible for data security? Let's see what you get out of this. I should like put the clock on and go ding, 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 ding. So I think you guys are great though. You guys are voting right away. Uh, we can actually see this coming up here. That looks like a stabilizing island. Yep, it looks like the majority chose question one. We have someone who minority said that it's a CIO's responsibility. So what do you think, Peter? What's the answer? So while your CIO knows some of this stuff, and it is the security officers that are responsible. By the way, stewardship is not typically concerned primarily with security. So yeah, we, we definitely like to see the everyone answer on that. Uh, it's a, a very good one. It sounds like you guys are right in sync with us on that uh, in order to take a look at it. So let's talk about the technologies that are involved in this and, and just let you in on a dirty, dirty, dirty little secret here in IT. The database management system is where most people think security occurs. Now, basically, if somebody is given a log on to the system, then they are assumed to be authorized to access the data that's in that system. That's only the case if you know for sure that the data that you put in that system all meets those access requirements. And that isn't the case. It isn't usually done that way. So again, just giving somebody access to the database management system may be very good for some organizations, may be a really terrible idea for other organizations. We also have business intelligence tools. And the wonderful thing is, while we're using these tools really well for BI, you can also use these tools really well to diagnose some of your data access things that are going on. So running web analytics, running, seeing what people are running from their desks and desktops and queries and things like that. You can use these BI tools to help you out with your data uh, security questions that are really, really interesting uh, in there. Your application development frameworks are another set of technologies that you have, and it makes sense if you're trying to simplify your environment. 
Uh, again, I've worked with a lot of different companies where they simply say we have one of everything. Well, the problem is you now have to know how everything works, whereas if you are a Microsoft.NET environment person or a Java person, hey, your application framework becomes much more constrained and your security problem becomes much more uh, manageable. We also have identity management technologies. Gosh, there's another typo there. I mean, identify management technologies. The identity management technology. That's, again, another typo on my part. I'm sure I'll have to doing that. Um, but yeah, if you make that particular change, this is the idea that when you get into the organization, there may be a single sign-on for you. your identity. Identity is allowed certain roles, reactions, and things like that that you can put in place. Uh, so again, very, very, very good set of technologies to take a look at. Change management and control systems, again, effective uh, uh, just last month, Google changed its um, privacy policies on all these things. And you probably got a lot of annoying screens from Google popping up and saying, hey, uh, you know, pay attention, this stuff is important. I was all reading them myself. This is the change control systems that your organization is wrestling with. How can you get these things to work? And how do you reasonably well put in place policies and procedures that will make sure that when we push the new version of it out to the public, everybody gains access to it in the same fashion. Uh, again, just basic practices and techniques and organization and culture are going to play a role in this as well. So we're taking a look here at the technology pieces. Let's dive a little bit more deep into something that will be useful for everybody in this case, which is uh, password examples. Now, uh, again, a question we've got for you guys, what is the most common password? We've got a couple of them up there uh, just to, to take a look. Which one do you think is the most common password? Uh, and actually, we may have to update this one at some point, Eileen, because I think we got some data last week that shows that one password is the, the new most common one uh, that we've got up there, um, which gives you guys a little bit of a clue, right? Where's everybody headed on this? Let's see. We've got a couple voting for, oh no, we've got a couple people that are choosing on that. All right, so most of it, what's the green one there say? So the majority chose answer B, password, um, followed closely by answer C, ASDF123. And nobody went for a dragon. <laughs> and I guess the Harry Potter fans were out of uh, out of the loop on that one. Actually, you're all wrong. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six is the most common password, and uh, you can try it on a lot of different systems and be surprised at how you get in. Um, but we are starting to see a lot of organizations that are making mixed numbers and characters, which is why one password looks like it might be the new most common password. Again, really bad idea if you've got that as your password that's out there. That was really smart. I put up on monitor and started talking again. I, I'm mono uh, mute. So what do we want to look for in your passwords? Well, again, eight characters is something that somebody's probably not going to be able to guess and that our brute force pieces are going to be a little bit tough to, to do. It's never the way it works. You know, when you see Tom Cruise in the Mission Impossible movies walk up to the door and stick a little thing in it that figures out the password pretty quickly. Um, but we can brute force an awful lot of things that are under that. It should be uppercase letter and a number. It should definitely not be the same as your username, and you'd be amazed at how many times people do that. Uh, it shouldn't be the same as the same five previous passwords that you use. It should not be the, any dictionary words that you can look up because that's a very good password hacking thing. It should just throw the entire dictionary at it. It shouldn't be incremental, password one, password two, right, even though you can do it and get away with it, the system will let you do it. Uh, when somebody figures out that's what your pattern is, they just have to wait a little while until it comes around. Uh, another one that we're looking at here then is uh, don't have any two characters repeated sequentially, so whether letters or numbers, don't use adjacent characters on the keyboard. If you can incorporate a space, that actually will really confuse things because it gives you a lot more. But the most important thing is let's try and change them on a very regular basis, about every 60 uh, days minimally in this case. And more importantly, let's put in place systems that force users to do this when they log on to the various systems. That way we don't have to depend on Dave over in the corner about doing that. Let's look at some specific information confidentiality classifications. And these may be good for your organization as well. It may be that your information is classified by default as general audiences. It may be that we don't want anybody outside of Data Blueprint, for example, to see this. Uh, so we would mark it for internal use only. We might mark it uh, 
specifically as not to be shared outside the organization if we're working in a competitive situation. We might want to show it to only certain individuals within Data Blueprint who have a need to know, or it may be that it's a registered confidential piece where we're passing back and forth between a business partner a way of approaching a problem solution so that we can, in this case, now start to put something out there where people will say, ah, here's a solution, but if anybody else gets a hold of it, we'll lose our competitive advantage uh, to do that. So this is just, again, some places to get started. Uh, data security policies, we've got two pages of them here uh, on this. So again, just in terms of getting familiar with the types of things that you're going to know, this also tells you a little bit about the type of people that you want working on this. You want people who can absorb this kind of information and be able to integrate it, because you can believe that nobody who wrote the Americans with Disabilities Act went to California Senate Bill 1386, the second, the third one down on that list, and said, let's see how it compares and contrasts with these. No, not at all. There's tons of different things that we have to pay attention to. So that's our first list of them. There's our second list of them. Just, a, a, again, a very, very large set of, of laws and things that you have to pay attention to in order to do this. And what we're really trying to do is to see if we can put in place something that works largely within these pieces, keeps people from going to jail, and protects corporate information. Uh, like it to be protected. Now, if you start to look at this in the larger context of the world in general, uh, when you start to outsource this information or outsource various processes, this information goes to places that you may not feel as comfortable at going to. Uh, again, there may be a company in China that is reading business cards. Uh, where you're doing some data entry work in there, but uh, what happens to those business cards? They're not going to be bound by U.S. laws. So any form of outsourcing increases the risk to the organization in order to do that. And the data security risks escalate in the outsourced vendor. So in other words, you've contracted with somebody to do this, and they've guaranteed you a certain level of, of uh, um, performance against that, but their data security risk is very definitely heightened in that outsourcing uh, context. If you transfer control but not the accountability, that means that you've now moved into a tighter risk management situation with, again, different types of control mechanisms that are also going to be problematic. And you can look at some of these specific mechanisms that include service level agreements, limitations to liability. Uh, again, I told you my credit card was hacked over the weekend, so uh, they just simply said, oh, we're sorry, you don't have to pay for the $5,000 in stuff that went on there in order to do it because it was clearly not done uh, by me. I was able to prove I was in a different part of the world uh, when that particular process occurred. Uh, what are the, again, contractual obligations? Are you reporting security breaches regularly? Are they reporting them to you? Do you have an independent monitoring system so that everybody knows what's going through? And can we increase the frequency and thoroughness of the various data auditing uh, pieces that need to go in place? So let's take finally our, our last topic for the day here about the security standards and guiding principles uh, in order to do this. So first of all, there are some tools that you should have for data security. We're not going to dive into them in this particular uh, instance, but there's some very good ones that people have been working on out there. There are all kinds of encryption standards and mechanisms that you can use. Uh, again, it's the kind of thing we're saying when, when a, a vendor says to you, your information that you're sending to us is safe because we use standard industry encryption. If standard industry encryption is good, you're in good shape. But if you don't know what standard industry encryption is, uh, you may not know that you are, in fact, good. And that's really a 256 uh, key, that key that we're using and things like that. Again, do you have access guidelines in your organization where people just simply say, all right, the policy says before I go into a new place, I should ask, I should ask permission. Uh, that may be the way that organization is set up. Your data transmission requirements. Uh, again, if you're sending credit card information, even within the firm here, there are all kinds of people who can set up little sniffers looking for a 16-digit number that begins with a four or five. Uh, and that's the way you can pick up a lot of credit card information uh, in order to do that. What are your documentation requirements from a data security perspective? I think 
really, if you focus on the second half of that, the, we certainly we want documentation requirements, but you know most documentation is done after the system was created. If we can sort of force people to do that up front where they should be doing it up front, it makes a lot of difference to the project. Uh, again, quality, security, these are things that you can't bake in after it's already been done. Um, again, I'll go back to Meg's example here. Well, let's build the cake without the flour, right? It would be a little bit difficult to come back and make that cake into an edible piece of something. What could you have if you made a cake without flour? A lumpy mess, right? <laughs> Certainly wouldn't be a birthday present for anybody. All right. Uh, again, remote access standards. What is the way in which you can access your facilities from somewhere else out on the net? Do you have uh, VPNs? Do you have uh, protection things? What are the reporting mechanisms that you put in place? And of course, our really fun one now, we have this thing called BYOB, which is bring your own device. People want to show up with their own iPads or Samsung tablets or whatever it is they want to do, and they want our organizations to protect them. So it means now we have a very, very difficult job internally figuring out how we need to do security given a very, very diverse world with everything on it. By the way, the other part of this that gets really fun is that people will take these devices and throw them away. And in fact, many of the things that were found out about um, the uh, Republican race in 2008 were very, very interesting because the McCain campaign simply sold their Blackberries, forgot even to wipe them off at the end. So all the emails and everything else was out there. Ooh, that's probably some information that you didn't want to have. Anybody see that movie on Sarah Palin recently, right? A lot of the dialogue came from that. Now let's talk specifically, we talked a couple times about roles here. Now remember, if I'm trying to write a role that says, Meg can do this, Lewis can do that, Eileen can do this, and, and Steve can do that, I've got a lot of rules I need to write. But if I change from writing rules for individuals to writing rules based on roles, make sure I say that very clearly, the process, again, doesn't become easy, but it becomes easier. So what you see here, is that we've got two users, A and B, that can create, read, and update, okay, in order to do that from work unit A. But if we want somebody to be able to go back in and only read that information, we have a different role where work unit C, because they come from finance, should only be able to read that information. The process of creating roles is very, very important. If your organization isn't doing that, again, give us a call to point some, in some direction so they can do this. So let's finish up here at the top of the hour again with some guiding principles. Even if you're not the CISO, Chief Information System Security Officer in your organization, somebody has the responsibility to be a data trustee. It's a governance issue. That could be you, and if you step up to it or at least make people aware of it, that's good. You need to understand and comply with the top regulations that are in your area. You need to understand that data to process and data to role matrices are really the tools that you're going to use to guide the group and various other types of permissions that you need to have. You have various security requirements and policies, and you're going to have to define them as a collaborative effort because if you simply push them out onto people, uh, they aren't going to be correct the first time and you're going to need some more information in order to do that. These security requirements must be done in conjunction with your development projects. They can't be properly retrofitted after it's done. And yet when we see organizations make mistakes, we see this mistake being one of the top ones that they make over and over and over again. Number six here, what we really want you to do is look at uh, the enterprise data against the classification confidentiality schema. This will give us the opportunity again to put in place these very clear types of, of roles and things that we do. We want you to follow strong password guidelines just to get people used to them. We want you to create these role groups, so defining privileges by role and granting users uh, privileges by incorporating them in these various role groups. And where it's possible, restrict users to one role. What that means is that if you're a customer and a employee of the organization, you may have to have two separate roles in order to do that, and we'd ask you to sign out as an employee and sign on as a customer, just to an example of that. Uh, then in addition to that, we want to formally manage requests for authorization and changes and have a central user manager that takes care of the groups uh, in order to do this. So we're right at the top of the hour here again, and uh, again, what we really want you to be thinking about is hopefully you have a good idea of this slide right here that I'm showing up, which is 
our summary of what we're trying to do from data management. There are a lot of different moving parts in this. It's a very new area. And we have a question for you all as well uh, that we wanted to know how you feel your, how safe you feel your data is. So if you'd be willing to share this with us, we're not going to link this with anything or say anything about it. We just collect these statistics and we're trying to see trend wise are we getting better or worse. But you'll take a minute and give us some feedback on that and just let us know do you think your data is trustably safe, safe enough, not safe, or dangerous that represents a liability to our organization. And we'll share the overall results with you here. Eileen, I'll let you get on and read the numbers when we get them all the way to the top. Second question we were going to ask you at the top of the hour here before we let you start asking us questions. We know this is a very high level overview of this. We believe that this information has given you enough information to pass the CDMP portion of the security portion of the exam because uh, this is what it covers. But is there other interest? Are there those of you out there that would be interested in a deeper dive into this area? We'll ask you that question in just a minute. Eileen, can you tell us what the results were for that first part? Yep, so it looks like the majority of you considers your data safe enough or trustably safe. So that's actually pretty good results. Uh, this may have been too introductory material for you guys, or maybe your organizations are just more mature. Our curves, our um, surveys don't show that that is typically the case for most organizations. So those of you that are, in fact, considering your data into category A or B should congratulate yourselves or maybe your CISOs to do that. Uh, I think that's sort of proof in the pudding that this does work. Uh, so the other question we were going to ask you is if, if we were going to put another version of this together, would you be interested in this? And we'll just let you click on the A or B if you're interested. We should make that A, yes, D. I'm not very good at this, am I, Ellie? <laughs> i got to work no, on you're fine. <laughs> And then we'll move on to our question and answer session here. I'll give you a little bit more time to respond to let us know. Yeah, probably about uh, 30, 60 days or so we put something like that on if I was interested in it. It looks like about half, doesn't it? Yeah, it's about right and a half. Your help on that one, and let's move on to our question and answer session then. We, of course, leave you with some references in here to take a look at. Uh, again, they've done some great uh, jobs of making some links so you can go directly out there. And uh, let's see if we get anybody. Do we get anybody on Twitter asking questions? I've always wondered whether people would ask a question in 140 characters or not. <laughs> they have some questions, right. all right. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone, and Peter. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, yeah, if, for, you, for those of you out there, if you still have your screen in full screen mode currently, just move your mouse to the top of the screen and that will change the viewing um, option so that you can submit your question through the chat window at the bottom. And you can submit it through public or private chat. And we did keep an eye on the Twitter feed. It looks like there was a lot of comments as people were following. So Peter, the first question, can there be good security while still allowing access? Well, can, yeah, can there be good security while still allowing access? Yeah, of course you can have security while allowing access. The question of security is, that's a great question though. Um, the question of security is making sure you have appropriate access. So it's not just a matter of blocking or not blocking as a, as a, 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 a mass, but they're really trying to make sure that what you have is appropriate access in there. So again, great question. Yeah, a lot of people think if, if I can get to it, it must not be secure, right? But it's, uh, it's very definitely doesn't work in that direction. Okay, so let's see what else we have. Um, what does data security really mean? <laughs> so that's sort of a philosophical question, but it's a good one. What, what happens here is that you're trying to figure out what works for your organization and that will keep people out of jail. So it doesn't do any good to say, oh, we're a very open organization and we do all this sort of thing. And by the way, anybody can look at anybody else's medical records, right? That will put you in jail very, very quickly. So you've got to find out what it means for your organization. That's really if you don't do that type of analysis, 
and simply try to do it strictly based on rules and regulations and things like that, it will not work. Okay, let's see. Do data security measures apply to everyone? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, people may not know it, they may not come in contact with them, and if they don't, that means your data security measures may be working very, very well. So don't take any of this as oversimplification, but in many, many instances, everybody has to be involved in data security, but some of it is keeping the users from having to do it. If they don't know it's out there, they can't try to access it. Right? So you want to be very, very careful with this. Again, the idea here is that specifically, data security applies to everybody. Not everybody is going to be as knowledgeable as you all are in the seminar because you're spending the time and effort to keep up to date on these types of topics or become introduced to them if you haven't had a chance to, to get introduced to them before. Absolutely, though, definitely an everybody function. Okay. Um, let's see. People are still the weakest link in security. Until you change your corporate culture to tie security to employee performance, casual errors will still occur. Any thoughts on this? I'll go back to my uh, slide on Dave, right? I think it's a very, very apt statement and very, very true. Unfortunately, we are always going to be catching up or reacting to the latest threats that come into organizations on this. And that is going to be a problem. So no matter what we do, firewalls, right, impurity, software, all this sort of thing, we're always going to have this thing called human error in the very big challenge no matter what happens. Sorry about that. We were checking out the tweet. Um, we're, we're integrating across like six different screens here, guys. You ought to see this. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. If you had to pick, what is the one primary guiding principle for data security? Wow. Uh, if I could do that, I probably would be uh, in a different – I guess it's just pay attention. You know, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if I'm in an organization, I, I went into a bank the other day and had to get $9,000 cash out uh, for somebody. And I was watching them go through their various processes and procedures. And I had figured out by the time they were done watching their entire organization go through this thing, they'd apparently never gotten nine, a request for $9,000 in cash. Now, that sounds crazy in a bank situation, but it, it really was true. Um, and, and, you know, I had watched watching them, I had figured out their entire security process just by sitting there and observing what they were doing in the organization. Probably not the best way to do it, the best way to expose it. So, so anybody who was bad intentioned, I was hopeful good intentioned or at least neutrally intentioned in that particular instance, um, could have watched this particular organization and learned way too much about what's going on internally. Uh, by watching this. So again, if you're observing this just as a neutral party, you better believe the bad guys are out there watching this very, very carefully and trying to figure out how they can take advantage of that. So that's, a, I think, a great place to finish up on is that if you're not paying attention to this, it will become a problem for you. Okay, um, let's see. Get any more questions out there? Um, yes. One participant is saying, I teach accounting information systems and have about one class to share the latest in data security concepts. What are your suggestions for spending that class time or an assignment outside of class? Oh, that's a terrific question. I would actually say, rather than asking me, I would get with somebody else who's teaching these accounting information systems classes and see what kind of exercises that they have to go in. I mean, the first question is, is it a 45-minute class or, you know, long class or short class and that sort of thing. But it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have people really think about this and give them something to come in and report on. We used to do lots of compare and contrast type questions. Um, so I may actually take your suggestion. If you'll identify yourself, I'll be glad to give you credit for that uh, in there. But it, it is a tough thing. But if, it, again, if you're getting students as they're going through the program, to learn something about this 
process by doing a little bit of observation themselves uh, in order to, to learn about this. I think you can only help everybody in, in the large run. Okay, and we actually also have a question coming through on Twitter. Should data security be embedded in the data access layer? Well, oh, that's a good question. Now, when we mean the data access, we're talking oftentimes mechanistically or automatically. And if you can put things into a layer that does it automatically, yes, I don't know that I would grant approval automatically in the data access layer. So again, it's looking for the right tool for the right level of participation that goes in there. Uh, these are going to be very important for organizations. It's something that you do want to pay attention to uh, in order to come up with these types of activities. Uh, relying 100% on automation, I think, is bad, but also relying 100% on manual is bad. So it goes to finding the proper balance between the two. Again, great question. Okay, let's see what else we have. I think it looks like that was about it. I don't see anything else coming through. Um, so um, it looks like that was it today in terms of um, your questions. Thanks, everyone, for participating in today's event. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks again to Diversity and Shannon for hosting us. And once again, you'll receive today's materials within the next two business days. Um, next month, we will focus on reference and master data management. Hopefully, you will be able for jo to join us for that as well. And as always, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. And let's also get some more CDMPs out there, right? <laughs> yes. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks, Peter. Another great presentation.